One of my favorite quotes is by Dr. Marshall Shepard, who's a climate scientist at the University of Georgia. And he says, weather is your mood, climate is your personality. So weather is changeable. I have no idea what the weather is going to be like on June 1st, 10 years from now. But because I understand the climate of New York, I know that it's likely to be hot. It's likely to be warmer than it was in January, for example. So when we talk about climate, we talk about long-term averages. Where Whereas weather is something that fluctuates on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's really important to keep those things separate. But at the same time, climate affects the weather because everything happens against the backdrop of climate. Wow, there you well, go. So, so what you're saying is uh, when people, if it snows one day, right? Like it late in the spring. You say, see, you climate change people are wrong because we had a snowfall in late April and, or early April. Mm -hmm. And so that's like the perfect moment to say, no, you're just in a mood. <laughs> it's not your personality. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> climate change is affecting our weather, and here's how. So imagine you have a pair of dice, and you always have a chance of rolling a double six. That's an extreme weather event. But decade by decade, as the planet warms, it's as if it's sneaking in and taking another one of those sixes, or sorry, another number and turning it into a six, and then another one and turning it into a seven. And so pretty soon you're rolling all kinds of double sixes and even some sevens like you never used to before, and you're like, what is going on? That's climate change. And that is Wait, but, but on, your, on your stereo system, can you turn it up to 11, though? That's really what people... <laughs> <laughs> so, in the case of climate change, yes, you can. Yes, okay. Okay, because it is odd when people say, we haven't had floods this high since 1936. Well, mm -hmm. you had floods that high in 1936 when no one was talking about climate change. So if the comparison to the highs today are always indexed to something long ago, what you're really saying is it's not that it's high specifically, but that we're having a lot of them. And like you said, someone is, is load, preloading the dice so that the six, the double sixes is no longer rare, it's becoming common. Yeah, another way to think about it is like a baseball player. They hit the occasional home run and then they went on steroids and they started to hit a lot more home runs. Okay. <laughs> so it wasn't that a home run was unprecedented, it's just that their statistics changed and that's what's happening with climate change. Help me out here because I'm sure people are thinking this. You're telling me we've increased two degrees in the last century or so, basically the era of the modern industrial revolution. And yet London is not two degrees warmer than its yeah. average. It's way higher than its average. Uh, so okay. how does two degrees warmer on earth translate into 10, 20, 30 degrees higher than average uh, temperatures anywhere on Earth. Okay, so let's, let's break that down a little bit. So the two degrees that people talk about that I just mentioned uh, is the global average change. But you have to remember that the globe is not warming evenly. It's warming more on land than in the ocean. It's warming more in the north than in the south. And it's warming most of all in places like the Arctic. So the changes uh, in, in New York or in London or in Paris uh, are more than the two degrees Fahrenheit that we're talking about in the global mean. So they're about maybe one and a half, two times that. So maybe four degrees Fahrenheit, five degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so maybe, so wait, so maybe you should change the messaging. It's not what the average over the whole world is. If that, if, because if it's a huge range in the manifestation, of, if that average is an average over a wide range of, of data, a wide range of values, then why not give the average increase at this latitude? We're at the same latitude as Madrid, or we're sorry, we, New York City, yeah. there. What the change is at Maine and in the Arctic. Why not give so, those numbers? We, so we do, right? So the yeah. Arctic is- No, you don't. I've not, I've not wow. heard you to give that. Okay. Okay, okay. okay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you here. So <laughs> the, 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 average, the average change in the Arctic is about four times the global mean. But no, did now how did oh, see, Chuck? So now Chuck, listen, who, here's Chuck, the have you heard anybody say that, Chuck? No, I'm gonna tell you. Here's the problem, Gavin. So as a scientist, when you look at uh, incremental change, you're able to understand that people are not. If you tell me it's two degrees warmer in this room than it is in the other room, that means nothing to me. What it means you don't give a rat's ass. I don't care. What you need, <laughs> you're is not a, adjusting the thermostat for right, that. <laughs> I'm not. You, what you guys need is a scale that registers in the human psyche. So in one part of the world, it's, oh my God, hot, okay? Yes. <laughs> and if we keep going, if we keep going, it gets to, God 
Damn! Right? <laughs> okay. All right, all right. Well, well let, let, me, let me bring out this scale that I, that I prepared earlier. He's trying to okay. stop you there, Chuck, because there's no, there's no yeah, coming back from that. You know where it's going. <laughs> you know where it's going from there. All right. Gavin. So, so you're absolutely right. You know, we're talking about numbers that really don't mean very much to people in their everyday lives. And so, quite frankly, I don't like talking about these numbers. I don't like talking about two degrees, 1.5 degrees, two, like four degrees. They are very hard to consider conceptualized because people uh, people's experience of temperature in their local environments uh, during a day over a season is very different to the planet's experience of temperature and so one of the things that uh, that I like to uh, to bring up kind of temperatures as the planet seen over its history and one great example is about 20,000 years ago we were in the middle of uh, the the ice age and uh, you know where uh, where you guys are sitting now uh, was underneath hundreds of meters of ice the, the glacier extended from the Arctic Ocean to Prospect Park in Brooklyn. They covered almost all of, uh, of North America. There's something similar uh, happening in uh, in the UK. There was enough. And by the way, Gavin, as a as a kid, I remember I we, we took a tour of Central Park right in the middle of Manhattan, That's right. and there were rock escarpments that were identified as having glacial scarring. Striations. And, yeah. yeah, striations, right? Yes. And I'm I'm a kid, right? I'm like, glacier. What's a glacier doing here? What a well, glacier? It, it was there. Yeah, no, I, and, I remember uh, the, the, the the mental adjustments I had to make to embrace what, the, what was going on. Right. But go on. So the Ice Age was a radically different climate. So, you know, where we have forests and trees and that, it was, it was ice. And then for hundreds of miles further south, it was tundra. Uh, the fauna is different. The ecosphere is different. Uh, sea level is different. And do you know what the global temperature change was? Between then and now? Between, between, between then, then and, say, and the pre-industrial. Right, pre-industrial. Okay, how much? How much? It was about eight or nine degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, all so right. That's helpful. Are, th th that, I can use that. that. Is, I can use that. that. Yeah. So what I like to do is that, let's call that an ice age unit, right? Uh -huh. So that's 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 a big change for the planet. Right. 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 And if and if you go from where we were to, to the ice age, that's one ice age unit. And now what we've done since the beginning of the industrial revolution is we've gone up about a quarter to a fifth of an ice age unit. Okay. And where we might be heading could be a whole ice age unit in the other direction right right, right. and so okay. we think oh these are small numbers but they're not small to the, not planet. To the, the Earth. planet notices these things the planet uh, feels these changes in the ecosystems in the ice uh in the temperature and in the extremes okay and Gavin, this is very we, helpful that's very where we come helpful. back to what's happening now Okay. We're seeing the impacts of these things in the extremes because in, if, you can, if you can imagine, uh, you know, a, a bell curve and we're moving the middle of that bell curve a little bit to the, to the warmer conditions by, you know, a couple of degrees. But the things that are changing the most are out at the ends, are out at the very warmest temperatures or at the very coldest temperatures. So if you're, if you're in the middle of the bell curve, you don't notice it, but on the extremes, oh my gosh, it's the extreme. Right. It's right. Right, right, right. Okay. Right. And it's the extremes that make the impact, right? Yes. Nobody cares if a mediocre day is two degrees, four degrees, five degrees warmer than a previous mediocre day. But when you get to 100 degrees plus, every additional t degree makes a difference. It makes a difference uh, to how much the, the rails are going to buckle. It makes a difference to how much the airport is going to melt. It makes a difference <laughs> so, to how much so uh, energy... We, we can't land because the, the, the airport, airport melted. That's great. <laughs>and you know it happens everywhere in the world the whole freaking world is lousy with coal and mm -hmm. if you like to worry about things you're living at a great time because we'll never run out of coal There's oh god just coal everywhere in the world but the drag the drawback what sucks about it is burning it is putting all this carbon dioxide in the air and warming the world oil is also ancient buried swamp right that's 
under different pressure and temperature conditions turn to a liquefied version of oil. And natural gas is created even as we speak in swamps. People talk about swamp gas, right? right? Swamp gas. So about... Smells like goodness. Wow, who knew? Uh, <laughs> 30,000 barrels of oil worth are created every year wow. by burying modern swamps. Yeah. 30,000 barrels ain't no nothing, employing a double negative for, for emphasis. When we burn coal, oil, and natural gas, we are burning ancient sunlight right. stored in the Earth's surface, in the Earth's crust. Hence, indirectly, solar power. Indirectly, but it is a short I don't think term. we should let this information well, get should, out. I can see these, fossil fuel companies going, hey, we're solar power And so all. then there's this idea of burning coal cleanly. Well, even if you make it not sootful, not, not, not very much soot, you're still putting carbon dioxide in the right. air. So you're saying, what about solar energy that lands here every day, Chuck? That's what I'm saying. I'm saying, why don't we use that? If we're in outer space, okay. there's something we like to call the solar constant. The solar constant. Yes, which is how much energy hits a, a square meter of space uh, from the sun. From the sun. It's uh, 13, 1,360 watts per square meter. Down on the Earth's surface, it's about half of that. It's about uh, 500 watts. So over the course of a day, you get about six kilowatts per from square, square meter. meter. Yeah, uh, on average. And that's enough to run 60, 100 watt light bulb. That's not bad. It's not bad. Not bad at all. But what about powering the whole world? This lovely, fabulous computer driven television show and all your electric computer machines you have at home and the, we, the, in, the motors on our subway trains. The estimate is we'd need 500 billion square meters of solar panels, converting sunlight into electricity at about 10% efficiency, which is conservative, but reasonable. I have solar panels on my house that are about 15% efficient. Oh, okay. Spacecraft are over 30% efficient, All but right. when dust falls on them, blah, blah. 500 billion square meters? We could never get that much. You're crazy, Mr. Hippie engineer, not accepting the importance of fossil fuel, man. Oh my God, it's like you read my mind. 500 billion square meters is nothing. Arizona is 300 billion square meters. Oh, wow. So if we put solar panels on the roof of every building, every building in big cities, every uh, Home Depot, Walmart, Tesla factory, Chevy factory, if we put solar panels on all of these things, we would have enough electricity to run the place if we could move it around and store it. We see on the electric teleprompter the area the size of France. That's right. Now, God France. knows we don't need France. <laughs> well, not that. But France is big, but it's not that big. Right. Compared to the whole world. Yeah. Uh, look at a map. France is there in the middle. It's fine. And wait, that's the entire world? The whole world. You could run it right now. Wow. And this is why advocates of solar power are running around waving their arms. Yeah. Give us some tax breaks. Let's invest in this. Let's improve the efficiency. Let's especially improve the efficiency of our transmission lines. Right. So it sounds to me like we need the solar panels, okay, because quite frankly, we have the technology to go ahead and power the world with zero emissions completely, right? Uh, if some important details are worked out, if some transmission and storage. Right. And I was yeah. about to say, then it sounds like we need like some really cool batteries that will hold yeah. all this stuff yeah. together. The way to solve the world's energy problems, in my opinion, which as you know, is correct. <laughs> it's a big time saver. You know, Chuck, does this happen to you where you meet people that don't recognize your genius? You know, I'm going to say probably a lot more than I'd like it to. Yes. Yeah. But anyway, along this line, the way to provide energy for everyone in the world is with not one thing, not covering France or Arizona with solar panels, but everything all at once. We put solar panels everywhere, wind turbines everywhere they fit, geothermal energy where it's uh, proper to you or economical to use. If solar power is a power, but and fossil fuels are actually caused ultimately and by the sun. And wind energy is really a form of solar energy combined with the spin of the earth. Okay. That's where you get wind. And how about hydro? Hydro is rainfall powered by the sun to make water vapor evaporated and form clouds, rain, and snow. It's a big happy party here on the planet Earth where we have lit water in three phases and an atmosphere to breathe. Well, thanks to solar power, our future isn't looking so dark. <laughs> I get it? See you what get you did it? there? See that?
I, I know. And in fact, for, let me just lead off by saying, as I understand it, unlike the predictions of Thomas Malthus, where he said population is going to outstrip food supply and we will starve in mass numbers, he didn't know what role science would play in the production of food. So as I understand it, Catherine, correct me if I'm wrong, there is no shortage of food in the world. There's plenty of food and we can have food and even up to 10 billion people. But it's the distribution networks of food and that is the problem, right? And so I don't know that climate change issues or food production issues can actually solve that problem. It's a political problem, isn't it? Well, that's exactly it. We waste in high income countries, we waste 50% of the food that we produce just by too much on our plates, throw it out, rotting in the back of the fridge, ugly fruit, you know, food just past its deadline. Ugly fruit. Yeah, there's literally, they take it off the grocery shelf if it's too ugly. I saw this, this is farm cooperative that sells ugly <laughs> fruit. I think it's called something like that. And you go in there, it's got some gnarly tomatoes, you know? And, and it's weird how we have a food aesthetic that has nothing to do with nu its nutritional value. That's sad, actually. It's very sad, sad, but what's even sadder is in low-income countries, they're also wasting about half their food too, but for a completely different reason, because they don't have the refrigeration and the supply chain to get it to market and to distribute it and to keep mm. it from going back. So it spoils. Yes. The it spoils, yeah. <laughs> then, then you have the challenge that industrial agriculture, especially beef, and to a lesser extent, other animal agriculture, is responsible for about 14% of our heat traffic and gas emissions too. So there's this whole ball of wax to unpack where we need to figure out how to stop wasting food, how to provide food to the people who need it, and how to shift our agricultural system to one that is truly sustainable, that provides for our needs and replenishes the needs of the planet as well. You know, that reminds me of, I saw a comedian joke about this. I mean, it's a very serious topic, but the, the joke made it even more serious. He was saying, you know, if, if you had a pen pal from some other, uh, nobody has pen pals anymore, but a pen pal from some nation that is developing and food is a scarce resource and you're telling each other about each other's cultures. And so, but what did you do last week? Oh, we had, we celebrated what we call Thanksgiving here in the United States. Well, what do you do? Oh, we eat as much as we possibly can until we, <laughs> on the brink of throwing up, we have to unbuckle our belt a few notches and then we just roll onto the couch until we digest it. And then we go back for more. What did you do on your holiday? <laughs> I mean, it was yeah. the, the, the stark contrast of our access to food and plus i don't know any other country that has so many fitness centers to burn off the excess food that we ended up eating never mind the food that we ended up throwing away in my experience I, I agree with you but I, I i i tend to have a more sort of realistic view and that is, I've only ever seen everyone change. Not all the time, but most of the time when people change, even when there were sort of conservationists and people uh, tooting that horn, they only end up changing when the act of changing improves their wallet. And, or, and so consider, you know, the movement to stop killing the whales, you know, back in the 1800s, and then we stopped killing whales. Was it because the movement succeeded? No, because we found oil, right, in the ground. And so economically, that whole thing switched. So don't we need an economic solution here so that the same sandbox can now make money cleaning things up rather than getting things dirty? Well, yes, and we already do. Solar energy is now the cheapest form of electricity we have ever had in the history of human civilization on this planet. And solar with storage, because of course the sun doesn't always shine at night, doesn't shine at all at night. In I was, fact, I was gonna say, I'm glad all. you yes. caught that because I was gonna be all up in your face on that one. Oh, well, if you're up in the Arctic, you know, you know we can get into those. <laughs> but that is actually cheaper than natural gas already in many parts of the world. And right now, I mean, just look at the price of gas in the United States and in many parts of the world. It is a lot cheaper to have an electric vehicle over a pretty relatively short time frame. So the economic argument is already there even in a market that is heavily skewed towards fossil fuels. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, not the IMF that Tom Cruise works for in Mission Impossible, but the other one, the real one, they estimate that fossil Wait, fuels- Wait, they're both real. Don't don't denigrate that movie. That's yeah. a the impossible mission for us. Don't, don't, don't bad mouth that. Okay, go on. Well, if they could just fix climate change for us, I would happily call them real. <laughs> well, 
It is an impossible mission for us. I don't know if we should give it to them. <laughs> kind of admitting that. If it involves fake faces, they could definitely fix the it. The fake faces, that's a fake face show. That's right. right. Yes. But anyways, the, the IMF says that the United States currently subsidizes fossil fuel use to the tune of over $600 billion, which exceeds the Pentagon's budget. So if you want to follow the money, we are not on a level playing field. Fossil fuels are subsidized, and that is why solutions like carbon pricing, which are endorsed by pretty much every economist in the world, including the two who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago, that's why carbon pricing is one of the suite of solutions, a policy solution that we need in tandem with our clean energy solutions. We need it to to work with our good old fashioned efficiency solutions because efficiency could cut our carbon emissions in half and save us money. And our nature based solutions where we take carbon out of the atmosphere where we have too much and we put it back into the soil, coastal wetlands, uh, grasslands, ecosystems, trees where we want the carbon. Put all those solutions together and then you have a plan to fix climate change. But you know, to Neil's point about the um, economics, uh, there's a different type of economics attached to this issue. and. It's social capital. It's the idea that people buy in, you know, that's, and, and that means that they have to first believe, second, believe that action is necessary with some type of urgency, and then third, punish those who will not participate in being the solution. So it's like smoking, okay? At one point, smoking was everywhere. It was cool. They smoked on airplanes. I can't believe it. When I see that they used to smoke on airplanes, I'm like, where was the smoking section? But the fact is that we don't do that now. If you lit up on an airplane, people would look at you like, have you lost your mind? Yes, yeah, there's an eject button and they throw you out the, <laughs> out the side window. But wait, so Catherine, so could you give me an example of a subsidy that we're not otherwise privy to that amounts to the 600 billion a year? Yeah, I can give you two types of examples. And this also speaks to the economic costs. So first of all, you have direct subsidies where, for example, um, oil and gas companies are paying you know pennies on the dollar for their land leases that they negotiated decades ago. And they're actually pulling from the public good. They're pulling coal and gas and oil from public publicly owned lands and they're paying a fraction of pittance of what that is actually worth. But then there's the indirect subsidies. And the way we set up our economic system is we did not put a dollar sign on externalities, which is the fancy economist word for things that we don't price, things outside our economic system. And so they didn't put a dollar sign on all of the heat trapping gases we produce, yet those heat trapping gases are producing very costly and certainly valuable impacts on us every day. Just to give you one example, Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey, uh, incurred over $120 billion worth of direct impacts. The indirect impacts extend for decades afterwards. It's estimated that 75% of those costs would not have occurred if that hurricane hadn't been supersized by climate change. So that's a single event. You're looking at over $80 billion from a single event. That's a lot of dollars. Carbon really is carrying a cost. And until we incorporate it into our economic system, we have a socialized system, which is kind of ironic for most people because people think, oh, those climate solutions are socialized. No, no, no. Our current system is socialized because we, all of us as taxpayers and insurance owners and homeowners and people who uh, suffer the impacts of fossil fuel use, we are paying for the price and a few companies are reaping the benefit. Hello, Dr. Marvel. What would be the top five climate solutions? I don't care how ambitious they are. How do you feel they should be prioritized above all others? Ooh. Thank you. Sincerely, Jen from Dallas, Texas. So Kate, it's possible to put pie in the sky goals, but maybe they're so out of reach, people get frustrated and then they give up. So maybe there's some middle ground between this is a big, audacious goal, but I think it's, it's accessible to me, so therefore I will do it. So I think that's a great question. Um, I also think that physicists are probably the wrong people to ask that question to, because from our perspective, climate change is happening because greenhouse gas concentrations are increasing. So how do you stop climate change? You stop doing that. And by the way, that's climate model, I was thinking hey, recently, a, a diet book written by a physicist, it would have two <laughs> words in it. It would be eat less. <laughs> right. <That's all. laughs> 
<laughs> so, so what do you have? You got you have a top set of goals here. Um, I would say you know stop burning fossil fuels. Um, okay. We know number that one. so much. Number one. Number one. Um, two. Number two. Probably eat less meat or grow meat in fats or eat plant based meat. I think so, that would so be really really helpful. Turn your diet into one with a smaller carbon footprint. However, you might accomplish it mm -hmm. because the day might come yeah. where we grow meat proteins and then you're not raising farm animals to do it. It would have a lower exactly carbon footprint than vegetarians do if all that's done in the exactly. lab. So that's interesting. Okay, three. Mm -hmm. Three. I mean, I guess maybe this should be number one, is don't vote for people who don't get it. My gosh. Yes. Duh. Duh. Oh, my <laughs> there gosh. You go. Yeah, who, right. who thought of that? Why? Okay. <laughs> Right. In a democracy, <laughs> we create our own government, right? And so you need an informed electorate so that the leadership can has the science literacy necessary to solve this problem. Very good. Okay. Uh, let's say electrify everything. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a lot of the things that we do to, right to now. To a clean um, grid. Like, yeah. To, yeah. A, mm -hmm. to a clean grid. Yeah, exactly. Well, you do it but, even you know, if you're not there yet. You have the, it even means if you're, you're not there yet. You built in the capacity right. Right. to take your energy from any of these other sources uh, without changing mm -hmm. your setup, right? Yeah. So right. an electric car is better than than an internal combustion car, even right. if most of that electricity is not generated from clean sources. But we hope right. that they will become generated by clean sources. Right. Right. And, you know, again, walking, biking, taking the subway, those are all better than driving an electric car. That's yeah. not an option for a lot of people who need to get various places. Right, right. That's so, boy, you just made me just imagine a time where we have a clean, smart grid, and then we're manufacturing clean technologies for transportation mm -hmm. all the way down the line it's one big loop of you know net zero yeah, uh, yeah. production zero. It, it, it's net it's zero carbon carbon net zero carbon, carbon. carbon. right yeah it'd be right. a beautiful thing because you're the electricity used to make the thing is clean and then the thing itself is clean like that's pretty awesome all, all around all around